we present how complicated acute type B aortic dissection with malperfusion is managed in our institution with thoracic endovascular aortic repair. Dr. Patel and Dr. Williams have a consulting relationship and patent with Gore. First, we will describe the management of acute type B dissection and malperfusion with figures of the different steps. Secondly, we will describe a case of a patient with acute type B dissection with malperfusion. This figure demonstrates the anatomy of a type B aortic dissection. Intravascular ultrasound, or IVUS, is an important support in treatment of acute type B dissection with malperfusion. The cross-sectional images of the aorta and branch vessels, shown in this figure, correlate to the images seen on IVUS. IVUS demonstrates which branches are likely to be compromised and by what mechanism, by showing the relation of the dissection flap to branch artery origins. In this figure, the primary entry tier is situated in the proximal descending thoracic aorta. The dissection flap, distal to this, shows evidence of collapse of the true lumen with dynamic obstruction of the celiac and superior mesenteric arteries. The dissection does not extend into these vessels, but occludes them by intermittent obstruction of the flap during the cardiac cycle. In contrast, the left renal artery shows evidence of dissection without re-entry in the course of the branch vessel. In this branch, there is formation of thrombus in the left renal artery false lumen, which causes a static obstruction and renal malperfusion. Preoperative CT scanning is essential to determine adequacy of the proximal landing zone. We typically extend coverage up to the left subclavian artery in cases of type B aortic dissection. And often complete coverage of the origin of the left subclavian artery is needed to obtain a 2 cm proximal landing zone as shown in section A. We obtain measurements at the proximal edge of the pathologic problem and then at 1 cm proximal increments to determine the correct stent graft size. The selected stent graft has a diameter no more than 10% larger than the aortic diameter at the landing zone. For section A, a 31 mm graft would be selected. Finally, a short stent graft of 10 to 15 cm is commonly used in our experience to avoid extensive intercostal artery coverage. Additional anatomic requirements for TVAR include the absence of a tapered neck, the presence of a 2 cm proximal margin, and a relatively flat arch to allow for a suitable apposition of the stent graft to the aortic inner curvature. Finally, the excess vessels are determined. The ideal vessel is straight, not calcified, and of adequate diameter to accom accommodate the delivery sheet for the stent graft. In this case, the right femoral artery in section B. In cases of short discrete iliac stenosis, intraoperative iliac angioplasty is performed to allow for femoral delivery. If these excess vessels requirements are not met, we plan delivery through a conduit placed on the common iliac artery or through the internal endoconduit approach. After IVUS examination, as well as initial angiography of the arch to determine great vessel origin, the excess vessels are cannulated. The tortuous left iliac artery in this case serves as the route for percutaneous placement of a marker pigtail catheter, used for both angiography and assistance in marking the site of deployment. Through an open exposure of the right femoral artery, the, the delivery sheet is placed into the terminal aorta over a stiff Lunderquist wire. The wire position is ma maintained typically in the ascending aorta throughout the procedure. Note that it is important to ensure true lumen placement of both wires to avoid the catastrophic complications of false lumen stand graft deployment or of extension of dissection to a type A. Finally, the stent graft is situated in the correct side and deployment is begun. 
After StandCraft deployment, balloon dilation to profile can only be performed at the proximal landing zone. We have been somewhat reluctant to do this for fear of tearing the already inflamed aorta. Completion aortography demonstrates accurate deployment and elimination of flow through the entry tier. IVIS examination of the remaining non-treated aorta confirms resolution of dynamic obstruction as shown in section A. However, as is shown in this figure, the left renal artery demonstrates static obstruction and this is confirmed by obtaining pressure gradients from the aorta to the renal hilum in the renal artery through lumen as shown in section B. In the event of angiographically significant stenosis or a measurement of a 20 mm of mercury systolic gradient, the renal through lumen is stented with a self-expanding stent with 10% oversizing. Completion manometry demonstrates branch vessel patency and adequate antegrade branch vessel flow. It is of major importance to look at these branches after you have covered the tear. At least you have to verify that these branches are perfused before you quit the case. A 68 year old lady presents with acute onset of chest pain 78 hours prior. She presents with normal temperature, a heart rate of 67 beats per minute with atrial fibrillation, a blood pressure of 147 over 68, a respiratory rate of 19 and the oxygen saturation is normal. Her creatinine at presentation was 1.2, partial thromboplastin time was 40 seconds, and her INR was 2.4. In the days after presentation, she progressively developed oliguria, and the creatinine was increasing towards 1.5, which raised the concern for renal malperfusion. Also, she had markedly diminished pulses in her legs and re requires intervention for correction of the malperfusion. Initial CT imaging reveals part of an entry trier at the mid thoracic descending aorta, as shown by the yellow arrow. This CT imaging demonstrates a collapsed through lumen with the superior mesenteric artery coming off the through lumen. CT imaging of the common iliac arteries shows a dissected left common iliac artery while the right common iliac artery is not dissected. This is an IVUS with thoracic aorta above the dissection. There we just see the beginning of the dissection between 5 and 9 o'clock. There is the entry tear flapping. And now we are below the entry tear in the distal thoracic aorta, approaching the diaphragm. At this point, the true lumen is becoming increasingly collapsed. Here, it's almost completely collapsed. And we approach now the visceral vessels. Here is the celiac artery coming off at 9 o'clock. Superior mesenteric artery coming off at 9 o'clock. There's the right renal artery coming off at about 5 o'clock from the true lumen. Left renal vein coming by from the left side of the screen. And here we are in the infrarenal aorta with a collapsed atherosclerotic true lumen. And eventually we go further down and enter the left common iliac artery. These are the baseline gradients of the different visceral branch vessels. The left external iliac artery, the left and the right renal artery, and the superior mesenteric artery. Those gradients are measured when a catheter is in the aortic root in the ascending aorta, and the other catheter is in the trunk of the particular visceral vessel. This is now a focused IVUS better oriented on the visceral segment. The celiac artery is coming off with the collapsed through lumen at 12 o'clock. And here is the superior mesenteric artery coming off at 12 or 12.30 from the collapsed through lumen 
left renal artery coming off at the right side of the screen and the renal vein crossing the front of the aorta. And here we are in the infrarenal aorta with collapsed through lumen. A Gore CTEC device of 31 mm of diameter and 100 mm in length is selected. And the standcraft is deployed in order to cover the entry tier, while intravascular ultrasound is used to determine fluoroscopic landmarks. And after standcraft deployment, the residual pressure gradients determine the treatment adequacy. We are now just entering the standcraft after it's been implanted in the aorta. We are now in the midsection of the thoracic stand graph. It only covers the entry tier and it ob obviously stops short of the visceral segment. You will see that the abdominal aorta true lumen is now expanded, even as this portion of the true lumen, which is expanded as well. Remember, this section was almost totally collapsed when we saw it on the pre treatment IVUS. And here we are, the celiac artery. We'll come off shortly at 1 o'clock. And here is the superior mesenteric artery coming off at 12 o'clock. The right renal artery coming off at 12 o'clock. And here is the left renal artery coming off at 5 o'clock. And again, the infrarenal aorta through lumen is also expanded. These are the final gradients, which shows better gradients in all of these visceral vessels. And the aortic stand graft corrected the static obstruction. Summarizing this particular case, there is an acute type B aortic dissection with malperfusion. There is a dynamic obstruction of the superior mesenteric artery and a dynamic plus static obstruction of the left external iliac artery and both obstructions resolve after coverage of the entry tier with the stand graft. During follow-up, it is important to evaluate the false lumen and the branch arteries originating from the false lumen. The collapsed through lumen at the level of the origin of the superior mesenteric artery at presentation is marked by the atherosclerotic intimal calcium and the true lumen is completely re-expanded one year after TVAR as you can see on the right figure. At the baseline you see perfusion in both the true and the false lumen and one year after TVAR you see perfusion just in the true lumen with also well perfused kidneys. At presentation, the left common iliac artery was dissected. One year after TVAR, true lumen expansion of the left common iliac artery was seen. This was our presentation of how acute type B aortic dissection with malperfusion is managed with TVAR in our institution.